Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the first podcast episode of 2024. Um, This is episode number 135, Bob. My God, and it's the first, it's, God, gosh, did you, have you had a good uh, break? Yes, yes, it's been wonderful, absolutely. (laughs) Okay, so what's the... I remember the title actually, but say it for yourself, you know, for the podcast readers. Yeah. Okay. The title of this one is Is There Ever Any Reality in the Therapy Room? <gasps> this is a bit well, Twilight Zone. Do, 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 do. I feel like I need to have a backing music on this. <laughs> well, off you go then. What do you think? Um, I want to say no off the top of my head. <laughs> I think we can be in the moment, in the here and now, but I think there's an awful lot of perception and idealization, whatever that word is. There's a lot of other stuff that goes on in the therapy room. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with more of that first sentence because for a lot of psychotherapies, or psychotherapist models. Um, the aim for a lot of them is to help the client be more aware and reflect on their processes and to help them stay in the here and now and help them to be in their here and now with their own realities. Yeah. And of course, more disturbed a client gets, the more they may slip out of so-called reality. Yeah. And start acting and feeling feeling from a different reality than other people's realities. And that can lead to what some people call psychosis. And when we look at di- diagnosis of psychosis, it's out of touch with reality. Yeah. Definition. I think that's a, f- a phrase that I'm hearing banded around. I don't want to say willy-nilly, but it seems to be a lot more in general conversations now about derealization and depersonalization it seems to be used a lot more now well you know those are words which come with like a dsm4 diagnosis of psychosis or moving away from reality that or their defense mechanisms to um, enable people to defend against their own reality so yeah they are probably used more um i think and it depends what you read as well but in terms of this podcast i mean the first question surely and it's not an easy one to answer maybe it's in the land of what you often say woo -woo land or whatever but you know the first question surely is what realities what reality are we talking about Mm. what is reality (laughs) (laughs) you know I mean, we can say, you know, what people often go to is consensus reality. If you can get a consensus reality, that often is the norm um, and uh, XXX. But when we have clients, of course, um, even though we may have a certain reality which may or may not fit into the consensus of reality and so-called normality, and this is a question to you, as well as myself in my own head, but really to you, I think, in this conversation, is even though the person's reality might seem a bit distorted to you in front, you know, in the couch in front of you. Yeah. What do you do with that? Do you do you go with their reality as if it was the norm, or do you go with that reality uh, as a way of getting to understand them, or do you go with their reality because you see their reality as perhaps have a higher lot of validity. I mean, I was wondering what you do when so when a client's reality isn't quite the reality that fits into your reality. All of the ones that you've just said, I would say, because I don't think I have a right to question anybody's reality. It's their reality. 
even if it's different from mine, it's about finding some sort of middle ground where I can understand the reality rather than discount it because who am I to discount the reality? So, if that makes sense. Yes. So what I think you're saying is that you will uh, use attunement or if you want to use that uh, word, or as a way yeah. of coming it's kind of like memories. Memories. Are memories real? Because we've filtered out certain things that fit into what we think happened. So even a memory and a recollection, is that reality or is that our reality of a situation? Well, I think you're absolutely correct. in, And I like what you said. And you didn't quite say it the way I'm going to say it, but because I can't quite remember what you said. But you said something like you you want to make sure you honour and respect the reality of the client in front of you. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, which is, I think, a very, very good starting point. Yeah. So I think, is, I think that is vitally important. So in this, before that logic then, so in a psychotherapy room, we can say there's multi-realities, can we? Or there might be. Yes, yes, yeah. I think that has to always be the case in my head. Yeah. I think when when you look at it, this is such a big topic, really. But when you look at it, I know you said off screen, or off, you know, before we started recording this about the matrix, there's mm. so many different levels to to our perceptions and reality and what's real and what's not and everything. I don't know whether anything is 100% real, especially not when there's two people involved. No, and then we have group psychotherapy, of course. Jeez, that's a minefield, Bob. <laughs> All these different realities competing for what reality is real. So yeah. with, so with the clients, with their different realities, which is obviously the case because they have different experiences, even though it may fit into what might be called a consensus reality. Um, I really like what you said, that you you respect persons where they're coming from, uh, to meet them, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I think there's a struggle that we all face and clients will face just the same. Um, and of course, there's a continuum of health where people perhaps are deemed more disturbed or, or they come into therapy because they want to deal with their dysfunctional script what they're often struggling with i think in their own consciousness and maybe sometimes their own consciousness is the realities of their internalized interjects yeah compete with let's say the here and now realities around them yes yeah i think that i get what sense. you mean yeah 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 <clears throat> and when you as a therapist when you start talking to the realities of their, say, parental interjects, then we have even more realities in the room. Yeah. Or may have. Yeah. I think when you said that, am I, if I'm on the right track, that's where I would maybe, you know, discuss with a client about taking it to court and checking, is this real? Is this true? When we've got that, internal dialogue and those interjects going on versus the here and now yeah so are we saying this is a very big question oh way up um, not necessarily any answers to this but in this co-created discussion are we saying that the reality that the therapist holds high has higher priority than the, perhaps the realities or past realities that the client comes from. I think it depends on the nature of those realities and how traumatic or damaging they can be. Hmm. I, I, I want to say I would challenge a client's reality certain realities that a client has that you know 
to better them rather than just going along with their reality. I will pull a client up if I believe that what their reality isn't what I'm seeing. You see, I think we have a duty of care, care to our clients. And most clients we see have, have, often have a more dysfunctional, damaged or toxic history. Yes. Perhaps up our own. Or let's put it another way around. I've done years and years and years and years of therapy. Yeah. So hopefully I've got a different, healthy, more script on the road than I had 35, 40 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Now the clients that come in to see me with their own unhealthy systems, I think I almost think it's a duty of care for the client to, you know, do what you just said, really, which is confront what might be happening in the from the realism or unrealism of the dysfunctional system of the client in front of you. Yeah. But again, I think it, it's worth noting that it needs to be done delicately <laughs> without shame or anything like that. And, you know, when the relationship is mm. formed, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I always like what TA therapists say. and I, th I like it. And on the other hand, I think, is ever, how achievable is this? When TA therapists, not all of them, so, you know, pardon me, the different TA therapists listening, but in a lot of the TA books, let's put it this way, they, they talk about contracts, treatment contracts, coming from adult adult positions. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm going ideal world. <laughs> at the beginning of therapy. And... That's not so achievable, is it? Not. Yeah. So at the best, I think I often may go with what I see as an adapted contract um, because it's not so easy to get an adult-to-adult -adult contract. Yeah. It's an interesting area that is about ad what's adult and you know, what you know, adult, adult defined in TA is often acting the appropriate that, you know, appropriate, appropriate your age, age you are in the room. So me acting, thinking, feeling as I'm 70, <clears throat> 73, or you acting, thinking, feeling when you were 21, or yeah. whatever it is. Oh, that's nice of you, Bob. I, yeah. I agree totally, but my adult changes moment to moment, <laughs> dependent oh. on what's going on. Yeah. So what my adult can be quite positive and, you know, uplifting, but my adult can also be quite angry and whatever. So it, it it changes. Oh, oh. So I think there's many realities in the therapy room. Yeah. Now, is it the therapist reality that needs to take prominence though? And now I don't think it's a particular answer to this, but I do think a, one of the traps for a therapist is if they think or start going down the road where they think their own truth has a monopoly. Yeah. When when you asked that question then, the thought that went through my head was, do we as therapists sometimes need to step into the client's reality? Good, good, really good question. And if I'm thinking that, then I would say, no, my reality does not take precedence over the client's. It's a really good question. Mm. Mm. Uh, and I think that... Uh, what you've just said there is really important. I think we need to get somehow get to a place where we can be attuned to actually, I would say step inside their reality, but get to a place where we where of curiosity, where we start to, you know, explore, understand, help people be aware uh, of, of where people are coming from. Yeah. Because however bizarre a person's, reported reality might be if you go back in time to the context of that reality or that belief system it will be utterly logical yeah uh, yeah absolutely however illogical it feels today yeah. at the time it would be an absolutely amazing decision that they made yeah right yeah and that's where a therapist needs to go, I believe. Yeah. They need to almost suspend their own reality to do that. 
Yeah, which again, being able to suspend our own reality means that we've got to be aware of what our reality is in the first place, which is why it is so important to have your own therapy and know your own stuff. That's right. If I look back at the last year, um, 23, one of the most violent years in terms of if you think of the Russian-Ukraine war, yeah. think of the Israeli and Palestine conflict, and we could go on. And they're about realities. They're about, in its essence, yeah. competing realities, what's right, what's wrong. Yeah. Um, I do hope this year is going to be better. Me too. In terms of peace and harmony. Yeah. And I think it's important that we do have maybe it's not a reality but we do have that you know child part in us that is always thinking the positive and wanting a better outcome see that, I think that's, that's a, a fantasy thing to... or... <laughs> yeah no 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 i think that's really true i think it's really important that we hold hope we hold positivity and we hold celebration we hold uh, the goodness of heart and kindness and everything else of these values we're talking about here in at least the therapist reality so we can you know hopefully model down some of those values and some of those ways of being um, with the client yeah and you, again you know I, I think it's probably come from my upbringing that I am you know potentially a glass half full rather than one that's half empty that even in the midst of terrible things there are people there that are doing wonderful work oh absolutely and, and that's, that's the bit real. that I try and hang on to yeah whether yeah. that's me you know in my child good. kind of blinkering the, the bad stuff out I don't know but yeah that's good and and very real yes yeah I, I think so. And I do try and pass that on to my clients. And what you said, you know, earlier on, I think is really, really important that, you know, rather than criticizing the decisions that we made at certain points in our life, it's really important that we understand that that was the best that we could come up with at that yeah. time. <laughs> and yeah. it survived, you know, we, we survived it and it worked well for us. Couldn't agree more. Um, I hope this, this uh, this podcast hasn't been too much in the woo woo land, but I think it's an interesting it's interesting things to think about in terms of what is real and what isn't real, and the different competing realities. And you know, I think is an important concept for therapists. Yeah, because I've... if a therapist goes down the road of putting their reality as the only reality there is, and honestly, therapy will never happen. No. What I call authentic therapy anyway. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, it's a dance that we're doing in the therapy room a lot of the time. You know, we're, we're for me, I, I'm really feeling whatever it is that the client's bringing each time. I've not got preconceived ideas of what, they're going to bring to me so it's a, it's a reacting in the moment to it yeah i spent most of my time clinical life trying to get away from assumptions mm. not so easy no no <laughs> yes i completely agree so so yes thank you for that bob it's it's been another really interesting one i think that could have been a lot a lot longer and I like to have woo-woo conversations. The, the, I'm not sure which podcast it was, but a few ago where we years were talking ago, about existential questions and things yes. like that. It's really yeah. good to to get our mind thinking from a different perspective sometimes. Yeah, I was talking about Irvin Yalom. Yes. Lots of wonderful books on you know, working with groups, working existentially, lots of accessible tales from the psychotherapy room. Lots of interesting existential reflections. And uh, I like that. Yeah. There's something that I'm really interested in and looking at, you know, from a personal point of view is, you know, the, the mind-body connection and how that works. 
with with, with healing do you know what i mean and the, the conversations that go in us as a you know a human being yeah and in a, in a embodied way i agree yeah and our gut instinct and things like that. There's there's a, a process to all of this. It's not necessarily woo woo. There oh, is scientific. No, proof. no. I mean, what you're talking about here is intuition, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, Eric Byrne, who was a creative transaction analysis, wrote a lot on intuition, and I think his very very early books in fifty seven fifty eight were on intuition. Yeah, it's kind of. Yeah, which is in the heart of the child ego state. But it, it's we we lose contact with it. We we rationalise everything, or we try and logicalise oh, everything. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Often socialised out, though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and uh, maybe that's a topic for another day. What's the next topic? Come on, Jackie. Let's see what we're going into twenty four with. The next topic is blind spots in therapy, which I think oh, follows on quite spots. well from this. Blind spots and red flags. Yes. You see, yes, it certainly does. Because if we allow ourselves to develop our heightened sense of intuition, or at least be in touch with it again, we yes, it's a wonderful podcast. There we go then. That's what we're doing. Until next time, Bob. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.